All right, so can you see my slideshow okay? Yeah, great. Okay, super. All right, well, um, it's a pleasure to be there remotely. I think I was intending to come in person, but that was a century ago. Um, and uh, like Amy, I do just want to acknowledge the really stressful old times that we're all under. And I know, you know, some of you have loved ones who are sick or uh, have lost their jobs. And uh, it's a, a very challenging moment for all of us. Um, and uh, But what I want to do tonight is uh, step back from the moment um, and, and think about uh, the bigger challenge, if you will, uh, of our times. And um, But I can't ignore the COVID situation, uh, even in the context of my talk, because this is actually the first time I've given this talk uh, since the world turned upside down. Um, and uh, kind of, it really does change in some sense the story I'm going to tell. I think it, uh, and, and I want to talk about that as well. So um, uh, the first thing I want to say, though, and this is a project that didn't get derailed. It didn't get canceled by the, um, uh, by the virus. Whoops, excuse me. Something strange just happened there. Um, and that is that on April 7th, uh, the Center for Environmental Environmental Policy, which I run at Bard College, is coordinating a massive online event that's going to have thousands of participating schools, and it's centered around um, university-hosted webinars. So um, uh, there'll be one in almost every state uh, that's going to focus on big, ambitious things that could happen in Connecticut and Idaho and Alabama and Montana over the next couple of years that could really move the needle on climate change. Um, and uh, we've had to pivot and put this to be a purely online event, which has been exciting. Uh, but it, it now is revolving around uh, really getting ideally 100,000 students focused on climate solutions on April 7th and beyond uh, through a thing we're calling Make Climate a Class, uh, hashtag Make Climate a Class. Um, and basically, uh, we're uh, counting on teachers uh, who are climate concerned, and that's about 90% of them, to around the country at the high school level, college, university level, to drop what they're doing for a day and uh, assign these state level webinars to students. Um, and then we actually have teacher's guides for music teachers and philosophy teachers and religion teachers and economics teachers. Whoops. I think we need everybody to mute. That would be great. Okay, I'm, if everybody I'm could mute and also turn off their cameras now. Um, thank you. Hold we on. hear some background people talking that may not realize their mic is on. Okay. So uh, hopefully that's got everybody muted. I just muted everybody centrally. Hope you will have to unmute to uh, re-engage. So, oh, let's see. Back to the slideshow. Um, and Amy, can you see that okay still? There we go. We're back to it. Okay, um, so the idea is make climate a class, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, uh, basically, not, everyone knows a teacher. Uh, even we're not seeing yep. your we're not um, seeing we're not the slides. Seeing the slides. It just says you're sharing. All right, um, hold on. Let me go back to screen sharing. Oh, someone else is screen sharing apparently. Okay. Oh. Um, hmm, no, that's me. You. Okay. Have you got it? Uh, there you go. We're good. Okay. We're back up. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll talk more about that at the end, uh, but essentially everybody knows a teacher, everybody knows a student. And so the thing that you can do after this talk is to tell a teacher or tell a student to make climate a class in April. Um, so obviously the immediate challenge is the coronavirus. Uh, and again, the health challenges we're all facing, the, the shutdown of our lives, uh, the recession looming. And this is going to play a role in what I want to talk about tonight. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, skip that for now because we're going to come back to it um, and talk about the bigger ongoing challenge, uh, you know, which is really the bigger sort of piece of trying to meet the needs of, you know, what will soon be, you know, now eight and soon be 10 billion people on this one planet where, uh, you know, uh, half the people are barely getting by and everybody's aspiring to a better quality of life and more and we're already fighting over water and oil and fish and forests and biodiversity and it's getting hotter all the time. 
And of all those issues, climate change is the real existential one, I think, that we're facing and need to get our hands around soon. Um, and again, I think everybody needs to mute themselves. We got a little bit of background noise, so be careful if you're not muted, that'd be helpful. Um, and 2019 was the hottest year on record, and I want to um, uh, show this picture, which you've, I'm sure, all seen of the planet heating up about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. But what's really remarkable about this picture, and this is related to COVID, sorry, is if you look at this period from 2014 to 2016, uh, that run up in temperatures there, um, the planet actually heated up half a degree Fahrenheit in just three years. Uh, and this is that exponential growth curve that we're all becoming very familiar with. Uh, but uh, rather than being applied to the virus, it's being applied to the planet. Um, remarkable. Uh, and I bet nobody on this call knew that. Uh, you probably knew that those were record-breaking years, but I bet nobody knew that the planet actually heated up half a degree Fahrenheit in three-year period of time. And that's a big problem, right? It means that we haven't been talking about this issue as a society the way we need to. And I'm going to come back to that again towards the end about how we can change that dynamic. It did cool off, it had to, right? It couldn't keep getting hotter um, uh, in 17 and then 18, but then 19 is back up and we're so they're back at the second hottest year on record, not shown here. Um, so all of this stuff, as many of you may know, led the Earth, uh, the, the planet's top climate scientists last year to tell us that we had uh, until 2030, so 10 years now, to stem catastrophic climate change. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what that means in a couple of minutes. Uh, it doesn't mean the world comes to an end if we don't get done everything that we're going to talk about tonight. But uh, our lives become more and more difficult uh, as we uh, uh, fail to hit these targets. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I bet most people are pretty familiar with the basic science of climate change. But you can enjoy these little pictures. Um, uh, you know, the, the metaphor really that's relevant is um, a carbon blanket. So if the earth was an apple, the thickness of the skin on that apple would be the atmosphere. And for the last 120 years, we've been pumping, uh, we've been burning coal and natural gas in our power plants and gasoline in our cars and really just thickening the blanket of carbon dioxide surrounding the atmosphere. And that blanket, you know, lets in the light, but it doesn't let out the reflected heat. So, you know, the, the incredibly simple science of global warming is thicker blanket, warmer planet. It's really that simple. Um, scientists for the last 30 years have been desperately trying to come up with some other explanation for why the planet would be heating up so fast. They can't. And this one explains the data with truly frightening elegance. Um, it also tells us exactly what we have to do, right, to, to, to solve global warming. And that is we've got to stop thickening that blanket. Um, so we've got a dog now. So please mute your lines if you haven't already muted. Um, I'm going to show you one more picture that's going Nancy, to frame. Nancy, can you mute your your mic, please? Going to frame what we mean by solving climate. Um, and um, so this particular picture is going to take you back 10,000 years in time. All right. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of this blue line here, that's um, uh, when humans uh, uh, be, you know moved from being hunter gatherers to uh, being uh, pastoralists and, and herders, right? 6,000 years ago, that was the first cities in Ur and Babylon. Um, and uh, right here, the tip of this blue line, that's 2008. So that's the invention of the iPhone. So all of human history is wrapped up in that 10,000 year period. Um, and, uh, and what you can see here is that blue line is, is the climate. It's the Earth's average surface temperature. Uh, and we've got good data on this from pollen cores and ice cores, tree rings. And so we actually know that humans have been the beneficiary of an incredibly stable climate uh, throughout uh, all of our history, all of our civilized history. Um, and uh, over that whole period of time, the average temperature of the, of, the, of the Earth barely budged. And over thousands of year periods, it, it only went up half a degree and down half a degree in either direction until now. And what you're seeing there with that, that vertical line, that's the last 120 years compressed. And right here, whoops, right there, 
That's that additional half a degree Fahrenheit that we saw between 2014 and 2016. So when I say solving climate, um, and that means we get everything right this decade, then the best that we can do is hold that warming to about three degrees Fahrenheit, 1.5 degrees C. Um, that would be our best option. Um, and you can see that that's not so good because that, that still is gonna intensify all the problems we're having now with uh, you know, uh, massive forest fires, uh, um, uh, coral bleaching, coral, de coral reef die-offs, um, uh, rising sea levels, but it, it's still kind of within the frame of human experience. It's not that far out of the range. It's still uh, a livable planet. And if we can get this done, then our kids and grandkids, climate change is not going to be the biggest problem that they're going to be facing in the 21st century. It'll be a big one, but not the biggest. Um, and we're getting a taste of what some of those other big problems might be uh, right now. But if we don't do this, right, and we head on to a business as usual scenario, um, then this is where we're headed. So that would be an eight degree Fahrenheit warming within the lifetime of our children. And you put that number in perspective during the last ice age, when my house here in upstate New York was covered by about a thousand feet of ice, so above my head would have been a thousand feet of ice, the world was only nine degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is right now. So this is a swing in temperature of ice age magnitude only in the opposite direction within the lifetime of our kids. Um, and that is the future that we really want to avoid. That is the catastrophic climate change uh, that would uh, ultimately uh, lead to the displacement of hundreds of millions of people. Um, and uh, uh, with that many kind of people on the move, the sort of political instability uh, and all that would come with that uh, is pretty apparent. So uh, we have a pretty stark choice, um, but we do have a choice. And that's one thing I really want to emphasize because there's been a lot of sort of talk in the media about it being too late and we might as well just accept the climate change is real and it's happening. Uh, but we have a massive uh, sort of opportunity to create a world that is livable and manageable as opposed to one that really is out of control. Um, so I think you probably all are aware of this. This is a pretty educated audience, I suspect. Um, so let me get on to this idea of, of actually solving climate by 2030. Um, and what do I mean by that? I've been, a lot of people push back on how can you solve the climate? That doesn't make sense. But really what we're saying is uh, that if by 2030 we can be well on the way towards a 100% renewable economy, meaning we're getting our electric power from solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and really importantly for this conversation, storage. And by storage, I just mean batteries, so the same things that are in your phones, but actually big buildings full of batteries um, that can store really serious amounts of power. Because the emergence of cheap and cheap and getting cheaper battery technologies um, over the last uh, few years, actually, has suddenly made kind of renewable power a very uh, feasible 24-7 option uh, because you can generate lots of power when the sun shines and when the wind blows. And if you pair it with battery systems, then you actually can get very close to meeting all of your uh, electrical needs from renewable sources alone in many parts of the world. Um, but we also have got to have our transportation transitioning rapidly towards electric vehicles um, and away from gas fired cars. So if we got all that done in the next 10 years, then we would actually solve the energy half of climate change. So when we say solve climate, we mean let's solve that energy half in the next 10 years. And then we can deal with deforestation and land use and air travel and cement production and those other big sources that are still out there um, in the 2030s. Okay, but we have this opportunity in the 2020s to get the bad, the the, uh, the energy side done. Um, so I'm I'm going to frame this conversation in terms of a solar revolution and talk about solar dominance. And by that, it's a term that we coined. It just means the point at which 50% of global electric power is produced by this combination of solar plus batteries. Um, and you know why solar dominance? You know. Some people want to talk about nuclear power. Why not nuclear dominance or wind dominance or some other source um, and or renewables more generally? And the reason is that solar power in particular has got 
some characteristics that make it unique. Um, and the first one is that very soon, uh, by the mid 2020s, distributed solar, and by that I just, I mean rooftop solar, but not just on you know residential buildings, but also on commercial buildings and warehouses and on farms and in road medians and pretty much everywhere you could imagine putting solar panels. Um, plus battery storage in many places is gonna be cheaper than power from the grid. All right, uh, and that is gonna be a game changer because when that starts to happen, uh, unlike with any other electricity source, you actually don't need a utility to produce solar power. You don't need one. It's nice to have one, but you don't need one. And if the utilities object to this rapid solar revolution, which they might for good reasons on, from their point of view, then millions and millions of people and companies can and will just start to produce and store their own power. Um, and so we're on the verge of a market-driven revolution in energy techno production technology that's going to lead to a situation in which every factory, warehouse, business, building, shopping center, house, parking lot, farm, device, everywhere will have solar. All right. Uh, this is this idea of solar dominance. And it is the future. I, I, I think that uh, and this is a slide from a guy named Tony Siba, who's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and Stanford professor. But um, you know, McKinsey, uh, the big international consulting firm says this, the CEO of, of British Petroleum said this, um, the economics of solar are just relentless and uh, the future is this distributed solar world. It's coming. Um, the question is, will it come yep. soon enough to solve the All climate right. crisis? Thank you. Okay, we got another, somebody needs to mute their line. No, Amy, if you can I, I'm going to call out the names is. of the people who yeah. I see who have mics open. So okay. if you hear your name, if you could find the um, the mute button on your computer. It's, let's see, Chuck Litty has a mic open. Um, mm -hmm. Lisa has a mic open. Who else did I see on there? Judith? Judith, if you've got your mic open, I mean, I see your mic is open. And then somebody who's just a phone number, 650-776-6899. Uh, so if uh, any of you folks, if you heard me call out your name, could you please just hit the, the mute on your computer? Thank you. Okay. So um, a minute ago, I had you kind of compelled by this idea that the future was solar. Um, and then we had a commercial interruption. So let's get back to the TV show here. Um, uh, and um, yeah, uh, and the reason is uh, that solar uh, power um, has sort of two features that uh, have been very consistent since we started producing this stuff back in the late 70s, right? And the first is that solar prices have fallen on average 10% a year, um, just like clockwork. You know, a couple of years in the middle where they, they, they got off track, but just a relentless reduction in price of 10% a year. And that has kind of magical qualities, right? Because what it means is that five years ago, solar was 50% more expensive than it is now. And it was out of reach for many people without subsidy. Now it's close to parity, but five years from now, it's going to be 40% cheaper than it is right now. And then five years after that, it's going to be 40% cheaper than that. Um, so, you know, what's happened with solar and also other technologies, wind and electric vehicles and battery storage, is that they've been seeing this relentless price decline. Um, and in the last couple of years, they've started to cross over that parity line. So they're now cheaper than the fossil fuel alternatives and getting cheaper, right? And that's this rather exciting moment that we found ourselves in a month ago. <laughs> Um, and we'll talk about whether that's changed. Um, but, uh, but that really is the dynamic that's playing out. And the other piece about solar is it's the amount of solar on the planet has doubled every two years. Uh, so this installed capacity of solar has doubled every two years. And we're getting a lesson in what doubling every two years means from the virus, right? But we'll think about how that plays out in terms of the amount of solar that will be on the planet in 10 years. Um, all this has led to a situation where California residents will be getting solar power at the 
from their rooftops at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Two and a half cents a kilowatt hour in the next year or two. Now, I pay 18 cents here in New York. Average price in America is 12 to 13 cents. So this is the kind of revolution that's happening under our feet right now. And we'll talk about California in a minute. Same thing's happening with battery prices. Um, they just keep going down. Um, and so this is the situation. If we think about, so that's the retail grid price, 13 cents, and getting more expensive because the grid is old and needs maintenance and needs to be made smart. So grid prices are rising slowly. Um, utility scale solar, so big solar farms that feed power into the grid. In many, many parts of the world, these things are already cheaper than the best that fossil fuel can do. Uh, in the United States, out west, uh, in open bids, uh, solar and battery storage and with, combined with wind, these things have been crushing fossil fuels, right? So in Idaho and California and Colorado, we've had solar bids coming in, you know, as low as two cents a kilowatt hour, 2.3 cents a kilowatt hour, and the, at the retail, at the wholesale level. And the best that fossil fuel can do, the best that a new natural gas plant can do, four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So right now, today, last year, utility scale solar was half the price of the best that fossil fuel could do, right? And it's getting cheaper, and it's gonna keep getting cheaper, right? So at the utility scale level, if you've got an open playing field, in many parts of the world, solar is the choice, and over the next four or five years, it's gonna be the dominant choice. And that's great for new power production, but it doesn't solve the problem of what do we do with all these existing natural gas plants and coal plants, right? Oops, uh, sorry about that. Can you uh, still see my slide show? Uh, we see your desktop even. Yeah, all right, hold on. Sorry about that, let me go back okay. to that. There we go. So how do we solve that problem, right? How do we get to this solar dominant future? Well, that will happen when um, the distributed uh, solar crosses that same threshold. Uh, and this is gonna happen in the early 2020s in many markets in the US. It's already happened, for example, in Northern Australia, in Queensland, Australia, where about 25 to 30% of the power in that part of the world is coming from rooftop solar, all right? Um, so, uh, and, and as soon as rooftop solar plus battery storage gets cheaper than grid power, then you've got this phenomenon uh, where you're setting yourself up for serious market disruption where uh, people begin to defect from the grid. And people and companies in large numbers will increasingly use the grid as backup power, but start producing most of their power with solar and storage. <coughs> um, this is already uh, got an open mic there from somebody. Yep, thank you. Um, and actually, the mic is still open. Whoever just sneezed or coughed, that would be an open mic. So, great. Um, uh, this could lead to a utility death spiral, you know, where people defect from the grid and then the utilities have uh, fewer and fewer customers to, to cover their costs. Um, uh, and the utilities are going to oppose this uh, process as, as hard as they can. Uh, but this defection is going to be unstoppable if the economics of solar keep doing what they've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and the basic story is, you know, remember how we used to, to use telephone wires? Um, you know, we have this whole infrastructure out there on the roadside, right? All those telephone wires that are strung out there. And I, when I usually ask this question to a college audience, how many of you have used that infrastructure in the last month? And a hand or two will go up and it's only because they work in an office somewhere, right? Um, and, you know, that's where we're headed. And it's a very exciting thing for young people in particular to think about because they really are entering this world um, and they're at the beginning of this uh, clean energy revolution where, you know, we used to get our power by burning it in, in you know, coal-fired or fossil fuel-fired power plants or in nuclear plants and sending it out through wires. But increasingly, we're going to get our power from rooftops, from our clothes, and from our devices. Maybe can we pause for again? We, we have somebody who's making a fair amount of noise. Can you identify uh, Sorry, that? even I'm, I'm going to sorry, sorry, guys, to interrupt. Um, I'm just seeing there's still a couple open mics. So if you hear your name, it means we can hear you. Um, Jacques Matsumian, I see that your mic is open. Uh, Domenico, I see an open mic. And then um, there's also another person, a couple people with just phone numbers dialed in. So. If you hear your phone number, it means your mic is open. Uh, 203 
856-0160 and 650-776-6899. So if I've called you, please check um, and, and mute your mic if you don't know how, and Lisa also. So if you, if you don't know how to mute your mic, just speak Amy, up. Amy, I'm and just gonna, I'm gonna drop out. I think I can mute everybody from the center here, looks like. No, I guess I can't, or maybe I can. I think I just did. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go back into my slideshow again. Um, and hopefully people can see that. Uh, okay, so Amy, you can unmute yourself and if let me know if you can't I, we um, don't see, see your slideshow. slideshow. We see we see you now. All right, let's go back to the slideshow then. Um, do it that way, and then here comes the slideshow. Now I'm, I'm, I apologize, folks. I should have. Um, uh, You're back. Blue We're jeans good. is a little blue jeans is a little clunky for this kind of uh, presentation. Um, so anyway, we'll get through it um, and cover the points. Um, so. So that's where we are. And, and I also just want to emphasize that this solar revolution is going to be really exciting in the sense that um, it's going to end energy poverty in developing countries. Uh, there's still, you know, a couple billion people around the world who don't have access to affordable electricity and they're going to get it as solar prices continue to plummet. Um, and it's also going to break the political monopoly that utilities and coal companies and uh, and, and oil companies have had over our lives for the 20th century because they have controlled the lifeblood of our economic system, and that's going to go away. Um, and that's why they're fighting so hard to stop it. Um, but they won't win. They can't win. Um, and we can talk about how fast uh, that transition is going to come uh, in the Q&A, but we've already seen all of the coal companies in the United States go bankrupt, right? Um, and that's going to happen to the oil companies uh, much sooner than most people think. Um, so again, here's where we are, uh, every factory, warehouse, business building, shopping center, house, parking lot, device, everywhere with solar, that is our future. Can we get there by 2030? And the answer is yes, if the past trends continue, right? So we've talked about solar doubling every two years. Um, by 2018, we were up to about 2% of global power production from solar. It'll be close to 4% by the end of 2020 although perhaps the COVID might slow it down a little bit. Um, and if you just play that out and keep doubling it, then by 2028, you're at half of two thirds of the world's, world's power being produced by solar, just by continuing the trends that we've seen up until now. All right. Now, there's a million reasons why this wouldn't happen, right? Why, why we wouldn't produce this much solar power this fast. Um, you know, would we even have enough raw materials to produce that many solar panels? Would we have enough workers to install that many solar panels? Wouldn't the utilities use all of their political power to try and stop this because it would mean the death of their business model? And you know, wouldn't someone who lived across the street from a farm really try and stop that farmer from putting in uh, solar panels because he really wants a nice view, right? He wants to see cows instead of solar panels. And yes, all of those things are true and all of those would be obstacles to rapid solar deployment like this. But the counter argument would be if solar prices keep falling at the rate that they've been falling for the last 40 years, uh, there's going to be an inevitable sort of economic story about why everybody who's got capital is going to be installing solar as fast as they can. And for now, I just want you to sort of imagine this is possible and think about it in terms of what we call disruptive technology, right? Um, and if you had asked, you know, anybody in 2007, you know, just 12 years ago, um, how many people you would think would have one of these computers in their pockets within 10 years by 2018? Uh, nobody would have said, you know, two and a half billion people, a third of the people on the planet would have access to this technology, right? That just, no one would have said that, no one did say that. But we've seen over our lifetimes, a number of technologies that have gone from 2% market share to 70% market share in the space of a decade or so. Um, and 100 years ago, we went from horses to cars in 10 years. So uh, it's not just a tech 
this phenomenon, uh, this is something that happens uh, and is certainly possible in the context of a solar revolution. So just be, bear with me on this. Let's say we did it. Um, uh, so we're at 100% renewable power. So we've solved that. Check, we've got that. We still need to get there with vehicles, right? And uh, can we get from gasoline-powered cars to electric vehicles in 10 years? Well, first of all, all of the major uh, manufacturers know this is coming. They're, you know, they're essentially disinvesting in gasoline-powered technology. Mercedes-Benz last fall announced that they've designed their last internal combustion engine car. They will never build another gas-powered car, never design one. They'll still build the, their existing models, but all of their new models will be electric. And this is being driven by demand in China, uh, you know, regulatory policy in China and in India where, you know, millions of people are dying from conventional air pollution. But also the economics have gotten there. Um, and electric vehicles um, in many parts of the world now are as cheap as gasoline-powered cars and getting cheaper. Um, so that's kind of the point we're at. We're, again, at this crossover point. Um, but that won't get us there by 2030. Kind of a simple dynamic in which electric vehicles are cheaper and better than gasoline powered cars and my next car is going to be an EV, that would take way too long. You know, I'm not going to buy a new car until 2028 probably, right? Um, so how could you imagine really solving the transportation side in 10 years? And woo, that was a, a yes uh, from one of our furry friends. Um, the yes would be uh, that uh, something disruptive happened, and that disruptive thing could be autonomous ride sharing. And by that, I just mean driverless taxis, if you will. Um, and before you say, no, uh, you know, okay, maybe in 15 years or something, this technology is already here, right? So there's a, a company called Waymo, um, which is a Google offshoot, and in Phoenix, Arizona, or Reno, you can dial up one of these, uh, you know, you can download an app and then you can dial up one of these electric uh, driverless vans and it'll come pick you up at your house and take you anywhere you want to go in the city of Phoenix or Reno and nobody will touch the steering wheel. All right. So this, this technology is already in service in America, um, in commercial service. Uh, you can Google it, Waymo Phoenix, you know, watch it for five, you know, it's interesting for about 15 seconds and then it's just boring, right? Just the car driving people around. Um, so this technology is, you know, in, in pretty serious beta right now, and it clearly, a lot of people are betting lots and lots of money that this is the future, right? So last summer we had the Uber and Lyft uh, IPOs. Everybody knows these companies are never going to make money with paying taxi drivers, and so everybody who invested in those technologies and those companies did it because they thought they would be the first one to driverless. Um, Lyft in their IPO said they expected half of their rides by the second half of the 2020s to be driverless. Um, but there's real reason to think we're going to get there faster than that because this is one of those markets where the first one wins. So if you're the first one to deliver this technology to market, you're gaining insight, you're, you're gaining consumer loyalty, um, and you can be the next Amazon. So that's the race. The model that I think is really interesting is the, the Tesla model as opposed to the Uber or Lyft model. So Elon Musk told us last year that next year you'll be able to buy a $35,000 Tesla that will make you $250,000 in five years. Right? How does that work? Well, you bring your Tesla home, you plug it in, you unplug it in the morning, and then it drives around town all day and picks people up and drops them off. Right? Drives itself home at night, you got to clean the Pepsi out of the back seat, uh, and then plug it in. Um, and then you unplug it the next morning and it drives around and picks people up and makes you money, right? So that's a more entrepreneurial model of how this kind of thing could be incredibly disruptive in a pretty short period of time. Everybody who's in this game is already going electric because on a life cycle basis, EVs are much cheaper than conventional cars. Um, they uh, uh, can go 500,000 miles and are set to go a million. So somebody just popped in and needs to mute their microphone. That would be good. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, so, okay, I've sort of made the case that this is a possibility, but would it really do this? Is this something that's really going to happen? Well, if we go back to Tony Siva, who I talked about earlier, 
Um, he believes that this technology is going to be broadly ready in 2021. So we'll take it out of flat gridded Phoenix and we can put it into complicated, uh, you know, Hartford or um, uh, Philadelphia. And at that moment, if you're in a leading market and you have access to this technology, then this will be your choice. You can pay $900 a month for a new car. If you're going to buy a new car and that's all in with lease and gas and insurance and parking uh, maintenance, or you can go with a subscription model and pay $100 a month for a rideshare subscription that will take you anywhere you want in town um, at, with a convenience similar to a Lyft or an, an Uber. So you just dial them up, they show up five minutes later and you take off. That's a 10x difference, right? It's 10 times cheaper to pursue this driverless rideshare than it is to have your own vehicle. And what SEBA has argued is that anytime in the past there's been a 10 times difference in price, for a new technology that's entering the market and, this, and the, the service is comparable quality or better, that that's a recipe for extremely rapid disintegration or disruption. And he believes that if this gets started in 2021, it'll all be over by 2030, right? So this graph in the bottom, uh, the, the red line here is the percentage of rides that are um, uh, uh, taken in passenger miles, uh, taken in autonomous electric vehicles, so driverless. And the blue line shows uh, the amount of rides that are actually in personal vehicles. And you can see that 10 years time, everybody's riding around in driverless cars. Nobody's driving their own cars. And you can see what happens to US vehicle sales. They just tank. Um, nobody buys a new car. All right, I'm sure none of, nobody on this call believes what I just told you. I mean, that's just ludicrous, right? I just told you that 10 years from now, Americans will no longer be buying new cars, will no longer be driving ourselves. All of us will be tooling around in driverless electric vehicles. Okay? So, uh, makes no sense. But, again, pause for a minute and think about this. And from a personal level, if you could get around for one tenth the, the cost, would you make the switch? <laughs> Uh, and the idea is that the economics here is going to be so relentless that we'll all very quickly move into that uh, new mode of travel. Um, and it's interesting to see, as we think about the COVID thing, uh, you know, no one could, have, no one ever could have imagined, right, that we would all globally be spending a month in our houses, and yet here we are, right? So these changes can happen much faster than people think. All right, so. The point I want to make here is that uh, this idea of solving climate by 2030 is actually more plausible than most people think because we have crossed this technology tipping point. If you think about what, you know, how national governments have been trying to respond to climate change for the last 30 years, they've basically been subsidizing uh, and trying to make uh, alternative energy cheap and cheaper than fossil fuels, and, and it worked. It's actually, it's actually worked really well. You know, thanks to the efforts of the Americans and the Danes and the British and the Germans and the Koreans and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Indians, we actually have now delivered a whole suite of technologies that are now just crossing that parity point and are still getting cheaper rapidly, right? Um, so we have powerful market forces, us, forces pushing now towards both solar dominance and autonomous electric vehicle ride sharing. <laughs> Stop for a minute and say, well, what about COVID? I mean, does that mess things up? And it certainly screws up the timetable. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the press about, you know, solar expectations for solar installation and wind installation falling off by 20, 30, 40 percent this year. Um, and there's no doubt that the recession is going to do that. But the underlying dynamics are still there. And the trick will be as we come out of the recession, to pick up those lost years in order to drive as fast as we can in this direction. So I've been talking for quite a while and I didn't really, really get to the sort of what you can do part. Um, uh, but maybe rather than keep going, Amy, I, I can just take questions um, and probably pick up a lot of these points. Does that make sense? Sure, it's, um, that, thank you, Eben, this is, you know, Fascinating information, and I'm one of those people that was sitting here going, really? 
could we really do that? But like you, like you said, um, we've, we've done it before. Very impressive and very exciting to see the possibility. Um, yeah, I think that I, I know um, some of the folks on this call definitely want to know what they can do in terms of action. So uh, I hope you will get to that and address that. Um, if, do you want to look in the chat even, or do you want me to read out loud a couple yeah. of questions? Why don't you, um, I can keep my slides up, Amy. Why don't you just okay. find a couple of questions and ask me? Great. Yeah. Okay, so the first question comes from Andrew, and um, Andrew asks, is solar equal to the amount of energy that, say, an oil-fueled power plant produces? So, in other words, if we had um, an oil-fueled power plant um, fueling Fairfield County, how much solar energy would it take to equal that? Well, you would just have enough, I mean, you, you would have to build enough solar panels to equal the, the uh, amount of Power coming from the plant, so it, it's there's a there's a bigger footprint locally uh, in order to do that. But think about the global footprint associated with producing that oil and shipping it from Saudi Arabia to get it to your uh, oil power plant, right? So um, you could there's no question that you can you can produce uh, the equivalent amount of power to that oil plant. It's just a question of finding enough space to put those solar panels. Sure. And, and, and that's Andrew, why I said solar everywhere. Solar yeah. everywhere. Okay. And Andrew had a follow-up question. Andrew, if you want to unmute your mic and ask it, um, feel free. Or I don't know. Actually, even do you have everybody muted now? Can can we allow people to? I think you could unmute yourselves. I think I muted everybody. Okay. And you can if if you got if you have a question, let's try this. Um, you can open up your camera too, so we can see who's asking the question. That way, we get a, a little more sense of who's here on the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Evan. Yeah, th this has been uh, very educational, uh, very interesting. I'm co-advisor to the green team at Weston High School, uh, go Trojans. And um, just wanted to uh, say, you know, what's something that, that we could do as, uh, um, you know, as citizens uh, here in state of Connecticut to try to get our um, state government um, to take action uh, to try and, uh, you know, um, be, be, a, be a leader in some of the initiatives that you talked about. Well, I'm glad you asked um, because next Tuesday night, there's going to be a webinar coming out of the University of Connecticut um, as part of our uh, Salt Climate by 2030 Power Dialogue. Um, and uh, if you go to solveclimateby2030.org and follow the links to Connecticut, you can sign up for it. And we're going to have, uh, they're going to have three experts from Connecticut who are going to tell you three big ambitious things that the state could do or, or you could do in your cities in the next year or two that could really move the needle on climate change. Um, and I don't know what those things are gonna be, um, but it might be things like have your, every one of your cities in Connecticut, you know, set a goal of being carbon neutral by 2035, or it might be that you need to lobby your utility to be more solar friendly, but they'll specifically tell you next Tuesday night um, what you can do and how to do it. Um, so, uh, and what you can do is ask all your teachers to uh, assign that webinar as homework um, and then uh, talk about it the next day in class. So you can actually get uh, a lot of your friends involved in having that dialogue. Um, so actually, I'm gonna drop out of this and I wanna show you what I mean by that. Um, so apologize for my, uh, little Facebook slide there, but um, so this is the the solve climate. Can you see this, Amy? Yes, we can see it. We, okay. we see sort of a few screens up there, but we can see the, yeah, the main slide. Yes. You can see the solve climate by 2030 uh, website. So um, we're seeing powered 4720 power dialogues as well. Dialogues in 50 states. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you go down, you can click on Connecticut here and there you go. Connecticut's going to open up, um, and you can uh, then find out the speakers. Uh, they've got a bunch of interesting people that are going to be on, and there's a place a little bit further down where you register right there, register right there. They'll send you the link, um, and you'll be all set for Tuesday night. But the thing I really wanted to show you here was actually um, the resources for teachers. Because 
This is not just an opportunity for environmental studies classes or AP environmental science classes. But if you go to the resources link on our website right here, resources. Um, my, I'm a little slow here. I think everybody's watching Netflix tonight. Um, we'll get there in a second. Um, but anyway, what you'll see when we get there is that there's um, uh, links to teacher's guides. Here we go. Uh, for all kinds of subjects. So biology, business, chemistry, economics, anthropology, uh, art, uh, music, literature. Um, so if you have teachers who care about climate change and they're tired of trying to teach you stuff online and they want to take a break, they can assign that Connecticut webinar as homework and then they can use our teacher's guides to um, have an interesting conversation with you about climate change in art or climate change in business or climate change in philosophy or climate change in music. So um, I, my main ask tonight to all of you is to ask a teacher to make climate a class uh, at the college or high school level um, or ask a student to ask their teachers to make climate a class. Um, and the way you do that again is assign the webinars homework and then use our teacher's guides following. So got a very concrete thing for everybody in Connecticut to do as homework uh, coming out of tonight. Um, uh, get everybody involved in this project. And it doesn't have to happen on April 7th because <laughs> these webinars are going to be recorded. So really anytime during April or May, teachers can use the resource to make climate a class. It, it's fantastic that you're doing this, even. And I know um, our, our teacher in Weston has assigned it. And I believe um, maybe in Westport as well. And if there are people on this webinar from other towns and you can in encourage your teachers as well, um, I think it would be great to get this really widespread in Connecticut because Connecticut has been a leader in some areas in terms of um, you know climate change initiatives and, and we want to keep our legislators focused on it. We actually, I don't know if you're still on, Jonathan Steinberg, we have a state legislature, legislator who is on the call Jonathan, you want to speak up for a sec? I'm here. Hey, Jonathan. So, do you do you want to share a little bit about what what you think? You know, obviously, you guys are very focused on COVID right now, but um, in a more global sense, what kinds of state initiatives might might be uh, in the offing? Well, I'd say we're still struggling with uh, working with deep. To, they want to go to a, a pure market model for solar, and I still believe that there should be some subsidization to reflect the fact that there's not a level playing field with fossil fuels. And I want to support our solar installation industry, which is suffering right now, mainly because the utilities have great sway in policy in the state of Connecticut. So we have a lot of work to do, and we are on the cusp of moving to a tariff model that will change the nature of uh, the ease in which people in the state of Connecticut will be able to access solar. So uh, I'm a radical and I believe that we should continue to subsidize it no matter how low the price goes because it's a public good. Yeah, I mean, I would add to that that in addition to that, there's just a lot of obstacles that need to be torn down. Uh, that are getting in the way of, 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 of installing solar. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's not the case yet that rooftop solar and, and batteries can compete with the grid. It's getting there, and in two or three years, it's going to be uh, at parity, and in four or five years, it's going to be cheaper. But for now, the subsidies need to continue. But also just getting in place good local policies about, you know, siting, um, pressuring your electric utility to back off, and and create more solar friendly policies. I'd like to point to um, the neighboring states of Georgia and Florida. Um, Georgia is a top 10 solar state in, in America um, and Florida has virtually no solar, even though it's a sunshine state. And um, it really is just reflective of different uh, state policy regimes um, uh, uh, in, in those different places. And also in the Georgia, you've got a utility that's very friendly to solar um, and you don't have those in Florida. So, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot can really happen at the level of the states and cities and towns to make a big difference. 
Um, we have a few more questions in the chat, but I, I was going to call on um, Tom, who had a question about solar versus wind. Go for it, Tom. Yep. Andy, can you hear me? I'm, I'm dialing in on my phone. I was having trouble on the computer. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. We hear, we okay. hear. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, there's a lot of um, offshore wind that's currently being planned with, you know, with capacity rates that are quite a bit higher than some solar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How how are you kind of thinking about that as part of the energy mix kind of within the state? It's a huge piece, and in particularly on the east coast of the United States, um, where you know it's a great resource. It's you know you don't have to build massive transmission lines, so it's it's absolutely going to be a critical uh, resource where it's available. Um, and again, the price dynamics are really favorable. Um, it's still, you know, a bit more expensive than natural gas uh, under the current sort of regulatory regimes, uh, but the prices are coming down fast. And, you know, here in New York, we're committed to nine gigawatts. Um, you know, Connecticut's doing some, Rhode Island's doing some, Maryland's doing some. So the economies of scale are going to kick in, and that's going to be a very inexpensive resource. Um, it's also going to jumpstart a battery storage uh industry, right? Because a lot of that power is going to be generated at night. Um, we're going to have to store it and move it around. So it's all going to reshape. For wind? Uh, yeah. Wait, were you saying that wind is, is, is at night? A lot of it will be, I mean, it'll be at night during the day and at night, right? And so a lot of it will be generated yeah. when we I don't mean, need it. I think that just, you know, the solar, depending on where you are, is, is probably more yeah. conducive to battery storage, given that, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the peak of the day is at four, you know, between four and seven, where the peak of the sun is in the middle of the day, where you have things like California, where you have too much solar, right? So the battery yep. storage is probably more conducive to some, you know, to some solar than, than wind. Um, well, we're gonna, you're gonna have a lot of wind at night that you really can't use, and so it'll make sense to store it. Essentially, what we're moving to is a system where we're gonna have zero cost power, right? We're gonna be producing electrons that essentially are, are free, um, and that's going to generate a huge uh, incentive for people to build out storage capacity to take advantage of those of those electrons that would otherwise be wasted. Um, and that's all part of the reshaping of the energy system towards a renewables plus battery kind of world. Right. And if, and if you, um, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, um, economies of scale, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, utilities tend to get a you know a bad rap. Um, however, there are some utilities um, that are embracing it and can do it in a very low cost way. Um, you know, have massive scale, given their low cost of capital. And actually, Florida has has recently been really embracing um, solar. There, I think their regulators just suddenly realized that they are the sunshine state and they do have solar. And you know, there's over 4,000 megawatts of solar. Um, uh, about half of that's already built, so there's quite a bit in Florida. But mm -hmm. you know, a utility that does have a very low cost of capital can build a you know a massive solar facility, um, given that scale, um, maybe a little bit cheaper. I mean, does it matter mm -hmm. who who's building it? Well, I mean, partially. I mean, th that's why Georgia's got so much solar, right? Is that their utilities have been very friendly to it and they've been building it out. Um, so there is going to be sort of a, um, you know, we're going to need, I'm not, I'm not advocating for utilities to disappear. It's not a good thing. Uh, it'd be much better if utilities kind of figured out a business model that was conducive to distributed power um, and embraced it, right? So, you know, I think there are quite the dynamic that we would that like to see. That. Yeah, there are quite a few utilities that are doing that because if they can put that in their capital base, then they can earn a return on that. And yeah, um, you, yeah, for for utility scale, definitely, but not. It's very hard for them to do that with community solar or distributed solar. Right. right? And and that's really where the revolutionary potential lies. Um, if we just, you know, if we built out all new, you know. All of our new power plants were utility scale solar. That would be great, but it wouldn't solve the problem, right? We've got to figure out how to disrupt the existing power structure um, and 
the story that I've told would be that that would be a distributed solar plus batteries model, right? That would be ultimately what would take down the natural gas plants and retire them very quickly and render them stranded assets, right? And that is, that's the future that the utilities don't want, right? Because that's super disruptive to them and to everybody else. Um, but I think it's coming. I honestly think it's coming regardless of what the utilities want and what anybody else wants. I mean, my, my prediction would be that somewhere between, you know, five and eight years from now, it's going to be very cheap to install rooftop solar plus battery storage systems, and you'll be able to, you know, self-generate at a price below what the utilities can offer you power, at, at which utilities can offer you power. <clears throat> um, and then that becomes the ultimate goal a is... rapid transition. But if the ultimate goal is to displace a four or 500 megawatt gas power, fire power plant, you need a yep. lot of rooftop solar to do that. <laughs> you would, no doubt, so, no doubt. But my point is so, you'll get it because it'll be cheap. I mean, that's the, that's the argument. I, I would love to see that. Yeah, no, I'd love to see that. I well, think I mean, that you sometimes, you know, the scale of a utility, if you can get a utility on board to do that quickly, um, and if they're, I mean, listen, they don't care if they if they're replacing a natural gas with 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 um, with solar. They earn a return on it either way. Um, yeah, so, but the natural gas you know, the natural gas plant itself would obviously fight tooth and nail against any kind of utility initiative to replace that, right? I mean, but it's possible. Not necessarily. I mean, you could, yeah. yeah, I mean, we you know we just built a new thousand megawatt, uh, you know natural gas plant here in Dutchess County. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, they already are, right? I mean, the FERC, right, whatever, has got this new rule on minimum pricing and whatnot. So, you know, the utilities are really, I mean, they're, they're, they get it. I mean, and, and they're really ready to embrace utility scale solar, but they really don't want distributed. They really don't want to see it because it, it basically destroys their business model. Um, so right. that would be the reason they would embrace utility scale. but they're not going to do it at the speed we need to solve climate change. You know, thank you Bucky very much Fuller for, um, yeah, thank Buck, Yeah, Bucky Fuller once said that, you know, the way to, uh, you know, to sort of change the world is not to compete with existing institutions, but to render them obsolete. And I think that's what has to happen. Thank Hello. you very much for coming out. Someone, we really appreciate your time. Someone just shared their screen. I don't know what that uh, was about. Shared their, well, okay, I don't know how to. Okay, that's, that's right. I'm, it's okay, I'm on it. You can re okay. reshare. A um, couple yeah. other questions. So um, one that comes to mind is about equity, which is always an issue. Sure. Um, if, if this becomes affordable, say, to, you know, professionals, people, you know, quote unquote, middle class, what happens to the people who are still stuck with the utility because they either live in multifamily dwellings or, you know, in a situation where they cannot participate in this, um, you know, DIY solar market? Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's huge justice issues in this kind of rapid transition. So if we're going to solve climate by 2030, look, the world has to be very different in 2030 than it is right now, right? Um, and not in the sense that we're, you know, we can still have cold uh, beer and hot showers, but we have to be getting our electrons from a different source and we have to be getting around in a different way. Both of these models are super disruptive and create huge justice questions, right? And the one you just identified, which is if it's people with capital who are the ones who are gonna get the cheap solar power, you know, what do we do with the people who are left on the grid? And similarly, if you move to a driverless taxi model, what does that do to mass transit? Does it actually increase access to low cost mobility to low income people? And so this is another area where it's critical that it's, it's only gonna be a just transition if people like us get involved and help shape the rules as we move forwards, right? But I would, I think that the current sort of utility model is fundamentally broken um, and it's going to collapse in the face of a distributed solar plus battery revolution. So that's my prediction. Um, how do we fix that? How do we ensure that everybody's got access to low cost power? I don't know, um, but it's gonna be a huge public policy question. So, um, so I'm not kind of advocating that, you know, we destroy the utility model, um, 
I'm just saying I think it's going to get destroyed, and we have to figure out how to replace it uh, with a, a you know a grid that can deliver uh, low cost power, reliable power to everybody, to those people who aren't self generating. So a question from Alyssa. Um, she says, as use of batteries increases, any thoughts on the environmental impact of batteries when they reach the end of their lives? Can they be safely disposed yeah. of, recycled and en masse? And I would add to that um, also the the you know the political situation of mining rare earth minerals. Sure. Um, yeah. what, what do we do about both ends of yeah. the supply chain there? So once again, I mean, if, if we're really going to imagine solving climate change by 2030, the world, our energy system has to look really different than it does right now. And that's a massive industrial undertaking, right? So that's producing lots and lots and lots of batteries and lots and lots and lots of solar panels. That's a lot of mining uh, and a lot of manufacturing and a lot of pollution um, in places where it's not happening uh, now. On the other hand, you're, you know, shutting down uh the other you know an existing and much more massively polluting energy system right um and so the net gain is definitely positive um uh, uh but this is kind of where the sustainable business paradigm comes in right so in the process of moving to a new energy system it has to be one that's based on principles of, of circular economy um and the good news about batteries is they're they're fundamentally a circular technology, right? Um, they have valuable metals in them that can be recycled. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd have to build out a system and you'd have to build for recycling, right? Not as an afterthought. And the good news is that that's what battery companies are thinking about right now. One of our MBAs um, uh, is doing his senior project on sort of, he actually works for a, 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 a lithium uh, fair, uh ferrous phosphate company, so it doesn't use cobalt. Um, and um, that's his project right now, is to sort of help reimagine the manufacturing process to, to uh, design for, for recycling. Um, so again, this is an opportunity to move us in the direction of a much more fundamentally sustainable energy system, recognizing that if you're gonna produce power for 10 billion people, you're gonna create some pollution, um, and you're gonna have to do some mining. Um, and, uh, and then on the, on the, on the up, upside, the upstream side is obviously you want businesses, mining companies that are, um, you know, fundamentally more uh, sensitive to environmental and community issues in the, in the places that they're working. No magic bullets, obviously. And what's a little bit interesting is that it sort of turns the conventional environmentalist into a pro-development person, right? Um, uh, you know, so suddenly, you know, you know, climate change uh, advocates are like condemning those damn NIMBYists who are trying to stop all these solar projects. Um, and um, it's an interesting kind of change of hats to think about. Um, that's that's true. It's sort of the the free market versus the the government supplied energy. So. We, yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to beat the drum too much of this is going to happen inevitably and it's all the market's going to take over because there's clearly lots of policy obstacles and, and policy solutions that could speed this up. So, um, you know, there's so much that we all need to do at our state and local levels to make sure that this revolution actually happens. It will happen. I, I'm confident that it will happen on its own, more or less, you know, given enough time. But we don't have that time, so we have to figure out how to move this along. So Evan, this is, this is uh, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. This is Tony McDowell at Earthplace. Sorry we couldn't host you tonight. It's been fascinating. Um, I noticed the slide you had up there earlier was Paul Hawkins' drawdown and the 100 yeah. solutions, and you had uh, had little red arrows and what you've discussed with us tonight, which was terrific. But can you briefly just say? What about the other, whatever, 95 solutions out there and how do they they play into your thinking about uh, 2030? Yeah, I'm, I mean, so I put that slide up there really just to say, um, this is an all hands on deck moment, right? Uh, and not all of us are working, you know, in our day jobs um, in, in energy transformations. 
So as citizens, we all need to be doing whatever we can to uh, influence our state and city governments to uh, make, you know, smooth the path for these clean energy solutions. But, um, you know, in, in our, the rest of our lives, we all need to be picking one of those um, areas that we're passionate about um, and driving those solutions as rapidly as we can. So I'll put that slide back up. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, one of the compelling things about climate change is that um, no matter where we work or um, what our job is or whether we're students and at our university, there's, um, you know, whether it's in other forms of power generation or in the food sector um, around uh, uh, composting or, uh, you know, plant-rich diets or reducing food waste or regenerative agriculture or in the family planning sphere, educating women and girls or, uh, you know, more efficient buildings, retrofitting, uh, land use, forest protection, um, tra transportation. Uh, there's just so many things that we all need to be doing. Um, and in many cases, there's ways to do what we're doing more efficiently, more effectively, cheaper, and substantially reduce carbon emissions. So we all have to be working on that stuff. I highlighted these six because these are ones that um, are have sort of crossed that technology tipping point. They're now close to, if not below parity with uh, fossil fuels. And they really have the potential to scale in a hurry because they do have lots of private investment uh, backing them in a way that um, many of the other solutions don't yet. Awesome. I, I want to see if there's anybody else um, in the audience <clears throat> who wants to jump in with a question. Any of you students have something you want to ask Eben? All right, well, I think we've covered a lot of territory here. Um, even, do you have any last words for us? Any, any, you know, um, in terms of motivation? I mean, obviously <laughs> we've got to get on these the, the webinars next week and work with our state government. Um, and in terms of individuals, uh, what else do you think we should be doing as a, as a community or, you know, as people who are, very, you know, many of the people on this call are already very involved, uh, sitting on, you know, our sustainability committees, et cetera. What can we do to be more effective yeah. in, in moving this trans transition <clears throat> forward? Well, I mean, the, the recommendation that I give, especially to young people, but all of us really, is that, um, you know, the most important thing you can do to solve climate by 2030 is to join the political campaign of a candidate who best represents your views on climate change. Um, and, uh, and again, for young people in particular, that's a powerful, you know, way to spend your time, but also in a down job market, it's a really good way to pick up really good career skills. So, you know, you get a chance to learn how to speak effectively about a vision, you gain the courage to talk to strangers, and you're also just part of a, a powerful and exciting uh, sort of vision of the future, and you're helping push that forward. So I think there's nothing more important that any of us can do right now than is to, to really uh, work aggressively on behalf of political candidates who support our views on climate change. Um, and um, uh, that's going to be different, um, doing it at home instead of doing it in an office or having a chance to go door to door. Um, but there's a lot of work you can do to help out candidates in that context. Um, so, um, and for people looking for work, you know, if you jump on a campaign, say a state or local campaign um, in, uh, in May uh, and you prove your worth, you know, before you know it, you're going to be campaign manager in September and maybe even on salary. So, um, you know, it's, it's good work to do. That is very true. And we're, we're really lucky here in Fairfield County. We have a lot of very active environmental candidates. We have Jonathan, who's on the call. We have Will Haskell, who's our senator. Uh, Ann Hughes, who's a, a state rep from my area. And, and they're all, you know, either on the environmental committee or, you know, very, very high scoring on these things. So, I, yeah, I urge everybody to, to look into that and, and, and support these candidates. Even. Thank you so much for not only taking your time to be with us, but for putting this webinar together and introducing many of us to Blue Jeans who weren't familiar with it. And, um, you know, thank you everybody on the call 
for bearing with the technology and some open mics, but um, this is a great way for us to have been able to do this event. And, and Tony, thank you. You know, we almost got to see Earth Place, but we will hopefully do something there again soon. So um, a round of applause for Eben. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Amy Everybody and Tony, and thanks for having safe, me. Stay well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Peace out.